Please stand as you are able in body or in spirit for the call to worship. <coughs> praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adores the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let us sing for joy on their houses. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. And now let us join together in this hymn, the last verse sung in a cappella. <laughs> Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Christ, have mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Gracious, loving God, we come this day seeking courage and hope for the future. Our world is in such peril. Heal these wounds and quiet the words of war. Help us to be those who bring peace in our families and communities. Banish the darkness of doubt and fear, anoint us with your light and love that we may spread the good news of your mercy to everyone. This we pray in the name of Jesus as we also pray the prayer he taught us to say. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Because God has so richly blessed us, let us receive now, this morning, uh, our offering in gratitude for all that God has done and continues to do in our life. We will be singing the offertory together. You may stand as you are able. <laughs>
God of love and compassion, we ask that you, as, as we dedicate these tithes and offerings, we bring to you this worship. We pray that this would go to bring hope and healing to our world. Remind us of the work of reconciliation uh, and, our, and your call to us. Uh, we pray that uh, through this and through our lives, uh, we would be redeemed. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Would you turn to a neighbor and pass the peace of Christ? As you return to your seats, I want to share with you a couple announcements. I am trying very hard. I don't know if you can tell. I am trying very hard to rekindle our heart for worship. Uh, sometimes we do something so regularly, we lose the touch of why we do it. Like the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes you just got to think about what is it that we're actually praying. And so. Uh, bear with me, bear with us as a community as we change different elements of service so that we might really worship God in spirit and in truth. I want to share with you some an important announcements. Earlier this uh, month um, at our church council, we were wrestling with this, uh, this, this, this um, situation. We had, uh, uh, Stacia had been serving as our worship coordinator during my renewal period, and she has led us well. Her praises, I've been hearing it. Uh, and uh, though I came back, and so the need for a worship coordinator sees, we didn't want to let her go. And so the church council, uh, uh, we agreed that we would continue Stacia on staff as our coordinator for inclusion. The coordinator for inclusion is one that will continue to participate in the work of our worship planning, but also to be able to assist in all of our ministries to help all of us work toward that vision of church we really seek to be. And so Stacia, now no longer worship coordinator, but coordinator of inclusion, we want to affirm you. Can I offer a prayer for you as you, uh, as you begin this work? Will you extend an arm at, at, so that we pray? God, we thank you for Stacia, the gift that you have brought to her us through her, the call that you have placed in her heart. We know it is sacred. We pray that you would bless our shared time of ministry, and that you would grant Stacia a special wisdom and understanding, and that you would give us courage and ears and a willingness to follow. Help us to become that church in which you envision for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Stacia. Next week after worship is our ministry team huddle. I've been told that huddles kind of seem like intimate and close, like you have to be part of the team football yesterday. Man, fireworks. I thought the windows were going to collapse uh, in the office. Um, that's not what we intend when we say ministry team huddle. It is intended for everyone to come and see and hear and experience all of our ministries because uh, believe it or not, we at Tempe First are more than what we do on Sundays. Uh, there are a lot of ways that we are a part of this community, desperately changing, trying to change lives and make our world better. And so if you want to get involved, which you should, uh, come next week with the anticipation to stay after worship and join us in our time of fellowship. We will also be dedicating our book nook, uh, which is going to be awesome because it's already been completed and it hasn't been... I want to see more people engage and see uh, people be uh, blessed by that space. It's already been a blessing for myself. Uh, at the end of this month and into October, we will be um, entering a season of learning. As you know, earlier this year, our church 
was the recipient of the grant from the Foundation of Evangelism. Uh, the project, the grant proposal, was to engage in ministry with those with developmental disabilities. And so this developmental disabilities ministry grant um, requires all of us to be on board. And so over the next few weeks, five, I think, five Sundays, every Sunday we will be sharing with you, the entire congregation, an element of this ministry because really it is not someone else's ministry. It is who we desire to be. Uh, and so uh, it, we're calling it church, a home for all. Uh, and the ministry that we are starting is called All Abilities Ministries. They are doing their prep work right now on Saturdays between 5 and 7. Um, we're preparing the elements that we will need when we invite the larger public, but we need something. We need your participation. I need your participation. Um, it, it, I don't want it to feel like Somehow, we assume that someone else will tend to this. Um, no, we need to tend to it. You need to tend to it. Take out a finger, point it to yourself. I need to tend to this. I need to tend to it. I need all of you to discern how you will participate in this ministry because at the end of the day, this ministry is so that everyone can be included in the church. Uh, that ministry, um, All Abilities Ministries, they're doing an actual launch. It's on October 28th, their fall festival. It's the first public one that we will have at that event. Uh, think of, I'm thinking like Halloween season, you know, trick-or-treating and kids. And uh, we will need people to booth, I mean, to station booth, and we will need people to serve. And so come with the anticipation of signing up for this event. I think there'll be a sign-up sheet next week um, when that happens. There was one other announcement that I'm not remembering. Forgive me. When I remember it, I will share it with you. Uh, I want to... No, that wasn't it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 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 we will shift into a time of anthems and then we'll have our scripture reading followed by our children's moment. Growing us up in whatever we do, we 
Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If you are listened to, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If that person refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as the gentle and Gentile and tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. When there are two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Well, Miss Kathy is in South Dakota, and today we're going to talk about faith. Last week, Miss Kathy talked about faith and trust. Remember the game she played with Amber, the trust fall? And you trusted that Miss Kathy would catch you, wouldn't let you fall. That's the tra faith that we have in Jesus. Sometimes our faith gets wobbly. Have you ever doubted or gotten a little bit wobbly in your faith? And sometimes we need help from others. Well, remember the story of when Peter, Jesus was walking on the water? Yeah, and what did he happen? Peter, Peter tried to do the same thing as Jesus, and then he did it, but until he fell down into the water, but Jesus saved him. That's right. You know, when he got weak and fell, it's because he took his eyes off of Jesus. And his faith felt weebly, wobbly, weebly. Because sometimes we need somebody to help us in our faith, to help hold us and make us strong. So we're going to go in. Hi, Lexi. So glad you're here. So we're going to go in, and we're going to play a game about how we can help each other when our faith gets wibbly, wobbly. We <laughs> kind of get messed up sometimes. Yeah, we get messed up in our words sometimes, don't we? Yeah. And I also wanted to tell that it's okay if you slip sometimes and get embarrassed, but it's okay. You don't you don't have to be embarrassed because that there's because there's people there for you. That's right. And we're gonna go and learn about that today. Good job. Let's go you guys. And we're gonna go play that game. My hope for our worship is that we would truly worship God and then experience a robust and loving community and then receive God's affirmation as we're empowered to serve the world. How you do that in a worship format is what I'm seeking. But I did remember the announcement that I forgot to say. <laughs> During fellowship today, there is an art project that I'd like to welcome and invite you to participate in. It's a banner, a poster for the All Abilities Ministries. But it's more important than the poster because the poster itself is a ministry. There's a person in our community that has found it difficult to participate in this kind of experience, 
but felt welcomed enough to come to our Saturday programs. And this person's gift is in their art, and they could not finish this. And so by cooperating, it is the church affirming this person's gift. Not only so, this person has many allergies, and so the team has had to go through several different kinds of paints just to make sure we found one that didn't cause an allergic reaction. The entire project is a ministry. And so please participate in that artwork knowing, oh, you're not just trying to create a poster, but you are cooperating in the ministry of affirmation and love. Now, today, we are continuing the journey of faith with Jesus and his disciples as presented in the Gospel of Matthew, and today's focus is on reconciliation. But before we talk about this, I really feel like I need to bust two myths, a myth-busting kind of day. Uh, the first is that being a disciple is to police sinners, and the second is that there's this belief that some cannot be restored and thus be expelled from the kingdom. Now, I understand this because if you take a literal reading of verses 15 and 16 from our reading today, Jesus seems to suggest that we're supposed to call out each other's sin. Go and point out the fault, Jesus says. I don't know if that's what Jesus sounded like, but um, <laughs> go and point it out and take others with you if they don't listen to you. And this verse has left us an impression that as Christ's disciples, we're supposed to be some kind of police for those who sin, you know, correcting others so that they may live more faithfully. Along those lines, some Christians have come to believe that being a disciple of Christ is to know all there is to know about our Bible. And while I believe and appreciate the, both the desire, yearning, and necessity to understand and know our scripture, I am also against the idea that those who somehow know the Bible are somehow also better disciples or have a higher moral ground than those who do not. And yes, humanly speaking, it may seem that our moral grounding is vastly different from one another, but it's also true that we are equal recipients of God's grace. More importantly, I don't believe that justifies one's judging of another's sin. You may have come across your share of righteous Christians who argue about what is permitted or what is not permitted, or that something ought to be done or something ought not to be done. These folks are often well-versed well in Scripture, able to quote word for word about the very points that they are arguing, and it's as though one's ability to quote Scripture justifies their calling out another person's <laughs> sinfulness. But I don't believe that our instruction for us is this. Jesus is not giving us permission to examine other people's behaviors and judge them for their actions. We know for a fact Jesus teaches against judging others in Matthew chapter 7. To say that someone is in sin is to assume that you understand and know what's happening in that person's life and what God is doing in them. Therefore, it is to play God, and that cannot be justified. I mean, wouldn't you agree that it's already difficult enough to discern what God is doing in each of us? We would be fools to make such brash assumptions about someone else. Rather, I think we need to reinterpret this scripture with two other points in mind. The first is that Jesus isn't, I mean, Jesus is talking about your brother or sister when they have wronged you. These are people in your family, in your community, in your fellowship, in your support group. These are not strangers or people that you only know in part because of some other mutual or com commonality. These are people who have formed you, who make you who you are. Secondly, it's in the phrase, who have sinned against you. So Jesus, Jesus, Jesus gives us instruction on how we should go about situations when a sibling 
has wronged us. This lesson is not about someone's sin in a general sense. It's not about a sibling's sin against someone else or some other thing. No, it's about the relationship we have with the sibling and what we should do when harm has been done to such an important relationship. It's about reconciling with our siblings, reconciling with those in our community, those within our support. I presume that most of you, if not all of you, have taken either baptism classes or confirmation classes, and you should know by now what the definition of sin is in our Bible. Just to recap, sin is not something you've done wrong against God. When I teach confirmation class, I always make it a point to cover sin because it's often misunderstood. We learn about sin in Sunday school as things that you cannot do, like don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, listen to your parents. Yes, these are important, but sin itself encompasses a whole lot more than a list of things that we can or cannot do. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs. Yes, these lists, they're important for those who are younger in faith because all of us need guidelines when we're beginning, but sin is more than rules to follow. Sin, by definition, means off the mark. Sin is to be off target. And we understand that target to be God, or to be of God, or to be by God. So then, a reinterpretation has something happened in your relationship with a sibling in Christ in such a way that it has turned you away from God? Or left you feeling like something that they did was not from God? Go speak to them about it. And when you do, speak to them privately. Privately so as to not embarrass them or to dishonor them. Privately in a manner that upholds the trust, the sacred connection, relationship. You have to notice who Jesus instructs. Is it the victim or the sinner? Jesus instructs the victim to go and speak to. And that's likely because, you know, sinners often don't know the harm that they've done. And it's likely that they will do it again. And so in Christian love, we who have come to see this need to approach. But here's the thing. They might not listen to you. It might not make sense to them. And if that's the case, Jesus then instructs us to take another or two other with you. Now, we have a tendency of reading this portion as if, you know, Christians were supposed to uh, gang up on this unrepentant sinner. But that's not how I interpret it. You know, I think it means that we must also be willing and ready to be held accountable also. The inconvenient truth is, while it may seem that we are victims, you may be, we might also be victims of our own doing, of our own selves. We may, unknowingly perhaps because of some previous trauma or other hurt, take one person's well-meaning actions and behaviors and comments as something that was harmful to us. And it isn't them that need to be made known, it's us to examine ourselves. And we need a trusted person to tell us so we must be ready to accept even that correction for ourselves. For the sake of reconciliation, for the sake of a sustainable and accountable community, we must both be willing to receive correction, become vulnerable, even as we seek strength and courage to confront to a sibling of wrongdoing. It goes without saying there is no one who is without sin. And that doesn't mean that it's okay to sin. It, it, it simply means that sin is something that all of us must account for. Even the best archers 
archers who have no foe or no equal, they are still liable to be off the mark. We must address our own. We must still be accountable to ourselves. What happens then, if then, even when two or three have approached, they are still not persuaded? What do we do? Shall we forgive and forget? Do we brush it off? Do we move on? Do we say, can't we just focus on the things that we agree upon? Turns out that's not what you do if you seek to be a true church. A true church. Do you know that the word church only appears twice in the Gospels? I mean, it appears a whole lot in the New Testament, in the epistles, certainly in the book of Revelation. But it only appears twice in the Gospels, both of them in Matthew, and both of them Jesus is talking about the church. We know Jesus cares a great deal about the church because in Revelation, in the first chapters, the letters to the seven churches, I mean, Jesus cares about this community that he is going to die for. Jesus tells us, no, take the concern to the whole church. Jesus, whoa, that, that seems a little extreme. I, it's a private matter. Do we have to bring it to the whole church? I don't want to cause a scene about it. Couldn't we just ignore it? That's really nothing, is it? I grieve at how many relationships there are in churches that pretend to be okay when in fact there is hurting. Somehow we as Christians have learned that it's wrong to confront another. Maybe it's because we don't want to upset the boat or because we've been taught to forgive. But I don't think the problem is with our willingness or unwillingness to forgive. It's the fact that when wounds are caused by those in our support group, those who we trusted and loved, that wound, if left untreated, it will get infected. It will start to decay, and sooner or later, it will cause bitterness, anger, hatred, contempt. And it becomes apparent even in the church. We say we've forgotten that we've forgiven, but our actions and words, they say otherwise, especially in their presence or especially in situations that are similar to what has happened before. We don't give off a fragrance of Christ. We become defensive. We become less than. Now you should know Everyone sees this. And I would hate for someone who is unchurched, who is just trying to get back or experience anew for a church, a holy community, and then find themselves being triangulated by unresolved relationships, or worse, in between two groups of people in the church because they are in opposition to one another. We hate that. I hate that. It's fake. And it's as clear as day is from night. That is not what church, that is not what family, that is not what Christ's community should be about. That is not what Christ offered himself for. That shallow communion is not what Jesus died to save. The church is, the family is, Christ-centered community is, must be a place of reconciliation and redemption. It has to be set apart. It has to be different from any other kind of community in our world. Yes, your co-workers, yes, that forms a kind of community, but that community is based on your wages. If you're not paid, do you care about that community? Probably not. Places that you volunteer, yes, that forms a kind of community, but that community is bound by your ability to provide a function. If you can't volunteer, you probably don't mean very much to them. Christ's community is set apart from these. 
and it's set apart because we are a group. It's a place for the redeemed where reconciliation continues to be at work. The church is a place for reconciliation and redemption. Your family, Christian family, is a place for reconciliation and redemption. Christ-centered community beyond the walls of the church is a place for reconciliation and redemption. This is who we are, who we seek to be. As much as I like to talk about the church as a little piece of heaven, the reality is we are at best a rehab center. The church is not a place of perfect heavenly love where saints come and go, where everyone is perfectly selfless and holy. That's who we aspire to be. We are people who seek heavenly love because we find it lacking in our lives. We desire to be with saints because of so many others who have harmed and hurt us in the world. We desire to be with those who are holy, set apart, because certainly our life has to mean more than what this world has shown us. That's, that's who we are. We, we're an outpatient clinic where the redemptive work of the cross, the spiritual surgery has taken place, and we are now figuring out how to live our new lives post-op. The church is not yet the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is who and what we aspire to become. We come to this rehab center to recover for ourselves. Yes. Primarily for ourselves, yes. And also, because we know how hard that journey has been, how challenging it can be, we offer ourselves then as signs to others who are on different trajectories, different paths of recovery. We are signs, each of us, to the establishing kingdom of God. Turn to a neighbor, if, I, if you are encouraged to do so. Turn to a neighbor and say, my kingdom of heaven lies in the life you lead. <coughs> Hard to say? Yeah. My kingdom of heaven lies in the life that you lead. Friends, we are each of us signs of the community that God desires in this world. What sign do you offer? Earlier this spring, I found out quite randomly that our sister Joan Shackbach had lost her husband while on a trip to China. Uh, I'm assuming many of you are familiar with the story. It was, what did you say, Joan? What happened? Uh, to me, it was eye-popping. I was so curious and I was hesitant to ask for more because maybe it's not something she wants to talk about. I also didn't have the time right then to visit with her for it. And so I cautiously stated, hey, Joan, uh, I'd like to hear what that was about at another time, perhaps. And Joan, you know, as if noticing my hesitancy, I said, oh, Paul, all of it was by God's grace. And I thought, whoa, how do you go from that statement to this statement? I need to hear the story. And I was looking forward to our meeting. It didn't happen. The opportunity didn't present itself. Fast forward a couple months, and my family and I are in Osaka. Osaka, the second biggest metropolis in Japan. Um, we're on the last day of our visit together before my solo trip that would eventually lead up to Fuji. Um, the day was jam-packed with the plan, a proper city tour. We rented a vehicle just to be able to visit the of various sites. That morning, though, uh, just as we're heading in for breakfast, Nathan had a tummy ache. We thought maybe he needed something to eat because he could be hungry. Uh, but all throughout breakfast, he was not feeling well, and he had very poor appetite. And so we did what parents do. We had him visit the bathroom, which he said he had bowel movement, so right, good. But his discomfort had not gone away. As we're checking out of the hotel, heading to our car, our, our car, Nathan's 
kind of sluggish and moving around. His hand is on his right side. Now, I had my appendectomy when I was a young boy, and so I began to worry, but I didn't say it out loud. We got in the car, we drove quite a bit, and then we got to near Osaka Castle where we had planned to park and go visit, but Nathan wasn't feeling good. He wasn't doing any better. He didn't even want to leave the car. And Julie began to worry, and so I shared with her my concern. You know, if it's on the right side, things weren't right. It might seem quite serious. What we're supposed to do, should we go to the hospital? Should we wait for our flight? If it is his appendix and it does burst while we're in the plane, we're in big, big, big trouble. I found myself driving around the block in circles. I was locked in by dense traffic, and they drive on the other side, and so, you know, it's harder. Um, trying to think of a plan, Nathan continues to ache and moan. We were in a small six-passenger minivan, two, rows per, uh, two seats per row. I'm in the front. Our bags are in the passenger seat. Olivia and Julia are in the middle seats, and then Amber and Nathan are in the back seats. And Nathan, because he's moaning, well, Julie decides to swap spaces with Amber. I turn the signal and I pull over to the left. Cars passing by. I look back. It's her. Nathan's limped over onto Julie's lap. Julie's trying to comfort Nathan, but her look, you can tell without words, she was really concerned. Olivia's crying because Olivia can't see mom anymore. And Amber is trying to console and comfort Olivia, but she's not listening. And now Amber's frustrated. She knows her brother's aching. She's trying to do her best, but what can a six-year-old do? I'm there. I take out my phone. I open the map app, and I type hospital, hoping for some direction, and then instantly two, three dozen hits. They had vets, clinics, the whole thing, and the problem, it's all in Japanese. <laughs> up until this point in the trip, I used my phone as a translation device so that I can pick it, hold it up to the you know, Japanese words, text, and it will translate for me. I can't do that on the app. I need my phone to read the phone. I don't know what to do. And that's when my anxiety attacks began to come. I can feel my heart beating, and each beat felt like it was going to be the last heart beat. I'm breaking out in cold sweat. I'm panicking. I'm like, God, why? Is this how you're going let to it, lay, lay it down for me? Like, I've been bad, and so this is it? I'm terrified and I feel the tears coming and so I close my eyes and all I'm able to get out are two words. God, help. And in the midst of that chaotic moment, cars still passing by, pressing the horn because I'm stopped where I'm not supposed to be. I see Joan's face going across my mind and her beaming smile and she's like, Oh, all of it was by God's grace. And I'm like, someone who could experience God's grace while their spouse had passed, that's who our God is? No, that's who our God is. And I began to believe for myself, yes, no. I mean, it's all God's grace. God's grace is with me, has been with me, is going to be with me even now. And I felt this warmth and peace cover me. I was no longer afraid. I know what I needed to do. There are very, very many funny points that happened afterwards. But for the brevity and for the point of this story, we got to Korea into the ER immediately. It was severe constipation and dehydration. He's fine. <laughs> Jones' words were such the sign of God's grace. 
signs of redemption, reminding me, no, God is not out to get me. God is there providing love and grace and mercy always. Signs of redemption, proof to this world that we are indeed, can be reconciled with God and with each other. This is who we are called to be. Amen? We're confused, though, because in verse 17, it continues. Jesus says, if the offender still refuses to listen to the three of you who presented this, or the, even the church as you presented it, if they don't believe it, then, you know, treat them like Gentiles and tax collectors, people who are considered outcasts, sinners, those beyond the realm of the kingdom of, he kingdom of God. I think some have taken this to mean that we as the church have been given permission to exclude those, especially those who do not see sin the way that we do. There certainly has been a rise in churches that only serve like-minded folks, churches where all members belong to the same ideology, where work is actively being done to expose and rid of those who are on the opposing side. And, you know, for most of my life, I had hoped that this was, you know, blaming somewhere else, but I know now that is within the United Methodist Church, too. We're no different. Jesus says if even after the church approaches this person, they cannot become reconciled, then treat them like tax collectors and Gentiles. Yes, tax collectors and Gentiles were outcasts and unworthy sinners, but this was not permission to expel them from the kingdom. This was not permission for us to then gather as like-minded people. No, look at how Jesus treated tax collectors and Gentiles. He made them his own. Matthew, the writer of this very gospel himself, was a tax collector. Treat the unreconciled like Gentiles and tax collectors means not to make them outcasts, but don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. Remember, we thought of them as siblings. No, don't take it personally. Consider them as other. Consider them as ones not yet a part of your community, those who need even more understanding and consideration. You see, Gentiles and tax collectors are not on this side of grace. Metaphorically speaking, if the church is a rehab center, then these are folks that are not yet at the recovery center. They are pre-surgery, if you will. They require a transformation of their heart first before they join this. And as you know, that requires a whole different approach. They're not persons that we are trying to hold accountable to the cross. No, that's what happens after surgery. These are people we must selflessly love and serve because God loved us first. It's my hope to bring about these different understandings to these instructions so that we might live fully into being disciples of Christ, to be a church that seeks to be reconciled with one another, having been redeemed through Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus wants for us to be a church in this true and rich way, but isn't that also what we seek in our world? At least I think we mourn the lack of this in our world. We don't see places where people of differences are able to come together, do we? We don't see many instances when our faith in humanity is being restored. Our unique human ability to have con compassion for one another, even those who are our offenders, to become equally vulnerable as we all process our need for Christ's mercy. We don't see this. We yearn for that, do we not? Who's not moved upon hearing stories of mercy and reconciliation. Who's heard of the story of the Christmas truce in World War I, 1914? And who's not moved by that story? We long to see a world that is reconciled. We long to be a part of the redeemed in Christ. And so may we live into this kingdom reality and be signs of God's grace for one another. Amen. Let us pray.
Gracious and loving God, teach us to approach conflicts with love and humility. Guide us to address issues directly and privately, seeking reconciliation and restoration. May we listen and speak compassionately, aiming to restore relationships within our community. In your name we gather, trusting that where two or three are gathered, you are present, and our prayers for healing and unity will be heard. Amen. Let us rise in our body and in spirit, or in spirit, for our hymn of commitment. Again, the last verse sung, a cappella. prepare to walk away from the darkness into the light. Go into this world confident in Christ's love and God's eternal presence with you. Go to be witness for good and a bearer of peace to all who, whom you meet. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.